Church, uh, this morning I uh, want to speak about the Christian's role in uh, science and technology. And, and I'm uh, fully conscious and aware that uh, if I am not careful for the uh, next 45 minutes, uh, I will once again prove uh, Einstein's theory of uh, relativity uh, the, that is, uh, everybody becomes uh, mon cha cha, <laughs> or E equals to MC square. <laughs> you know, uh, an association of scientists one day elected one of their fraternity, another prominent scientist, to approach God and say to him, he said, Listen, we have decided that we have no longer any need of you. Simply because nowadays, you know, we can uh, 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 clone people, we can transplant hearts, and we can prolong lives and, and do all kinds of things that were once considered miraculous. Wow, God said, uh, tell me more. And the scientist went on to tell God this. He said, uh, you know, we can take dirt and form into the likeness of you and breathe life into it, thus becoming man. Wow, God said, that's very interesting. Show me. And so the scientist bends down, took some soil, and began to mold it into the shape of a man. But then God said, no, 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 no. Wait for, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, uh, you know, uh, not so fast. You go get your own dirt. Church, the truth of the matter is this, all right, that man or science simply cannot discover anything that God hasn't made. Amen? So therefore, this morning I would like to touch on uh, three main themes as I bring about uh, this uh, uh, whole area of our role in uh, science and technology. You know, God is not afraid of science and its discovery or its use. And so therefore, we shouldn't be afraid of that either. We should be unafraid to get involved in this whole domain of science and technology. If not, we should actually be actively participating and be involved in it. You might remember that God himself has mandated you and I to fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we read earlier on. That he has empowered and commanded us to study, to understand, and to exercise dominion over them. And so if God is allowing its discovery we should rightly then ask this question. God, how do you want to use this for your glory? Some of you might know if you're coming from uh, an agricultural science background, this man by the name of George Washington Carver, who was a black, Americans, uh, a black American born into slavery in Missouri, United States of America, somewhere around uh, 1864. He was a brilliant man. And using his great mind, he pulled himself out of bondage and slavery to become one of America's greatest scientists and inventors. You know, Carver's scientific discoveries uh, included something like more than 300 different products derived from peanuts alone. Some 150 from sweet potatoes and about 75 from pecans and, 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 and many more, you know, including crop rotation and, and, and so on. And so he was asked how he could think of a thousand ways to use peanuts. You know, this was his reply. He said, he held the peanut in his hand and he said, God, you made every seed-bearing plant. What did you make the peanut for? And so this morning, church, for many of us, 
You might ask the same question, stretch forth your hands, and ask God how to make use of it for His glory. You know, God really loves signs. Do you believe that? And we need to know that, that God Himself has used technology and taught signs for His own glory on numerous occasions, right from the beginning of times and from the Old Testament times, that is. Let me give you some instances, sir. But before that, uh, because of the fact that the two terms, science and technology, you know, is up there uh, uh, throughout this year, and it is going to haunt you, you know, if you do not really uh, know the full implication or the meaning of these words. And so, therefore, let, let me just, you know, put away, you know, these two terms, you know, for our own understanding. All right? And I try to make it as simple as possible. To say that science, uh, science is the process of finding out. Meaning to say that it will allow us to understand the world we live in and to be able to understand how it works, basically. And so the main branches of science, for example, includes subjects like biology and physics and chemistry and earth science. Some of you may not be familiar with what is earth science. Actually, earth science is simply uh, uh, geology, oceanography, astronomy, you know, um, Meteorology, and these are the parts of uh, uh, the earth science that is. Uh. Now, technology, on the other hand, is the application of science. Technology is basically using the discoveries of science and knowledge for improving the way we do things, and therefore we have such things as new processes and new materials and new instruments, you know, new devices you know, and machines and so on. Now, if failing to understand all that I've been saying you know, for the last couple of minutes, what you can actually say is this, all right, that science is knowing and technology is doing. All right? Science is knowledge. Technology is the application of the knowledge. And I was saying last night that if you want to sound a little bit more spiritual, you know, if you put an analogy, you know, it means this, you know, that uh, doctrine is nothing, you know, uh, uh, but knowledge, it could be just hate knowledge, all right, uh, precepts. Whereas when we say um, uh, technology, the analogy will be that it is the practice, you know, uh, the working out, you know, uh, uh, of this whole thing. And so, has it occurred, uh, church, to you that, uh, or have you ever asked or thought about the question, when did technology actually first appear? No. When it was the beginning of technology? And it's, interestingly, I just want to read to you a verse right, in, uh, uh, taken out of uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 22. And there it says, it says, Zila also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. And Tubal Cain's sister, you know, was Naama. Now, you have the time, you read a few preceding verses, and that will tell you that we have what is called the first city that has been established, the beginning of the tent-making industry, um, the breeding and managing of uh, cattle you know, in, in, in large or in extensive scale. And, and also, you know, in that passage of Scripture, we have the invention, you know, of uh, musical instruments, all right, and so on. And so here in verse 22, what we have here is the first record of the beginning of technology, that is, the forging of all kinds of tools, meaning of utensils and instruments out of bronze and iron. The first invented technology. And if you read that passage again, you probably would notice that all these contributions actually began with the ungodly, the unregenerate, that is, the line of Cain. And so therefore, you may, you know, scratch your head a bit and ask whether it means that God has no purpose for the godly line of Seth in subduing the earth and developing and using, for example, technology. I don't think that's true. We can see that the godly line, you know, also have a great share, you know, in these gifts of God that God gave to the, uh, the unregenerate days. Give you an example, you know, uh, 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 from scripture. Uh, that is, you know, in the technology of art, for example, right? Genesis, record, uh, Genesis chapter 6, you will remember, records for us the incident uh, of the flood through which what God 
had wanted to do was, uh, uh, they decided to do was to wipe up the wicked race of mankind. And only Noah and his family were to be spared. But then the thing is this, that the way God chose uh, to save this family was not by some miraculous intervention or to send these people up to some uh, high mountain uh, places you know, so that the flood would not be able to reach them. It was by the use of human skill, uh, church, and technology that God chose to save Noah and his family. And so therefore, God specifically ordered Noah to build an ark, all right, according to certain specifications. And this is what you know, the Word of God said, that says, Genesis chapter 6, huh? all right, now it says, So make yourself you know, an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. And put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Church, I want to say this to you, that this was no fanciful or clumsy vessel. It was a seaworthy vessel. It was large and it was evidently well planned and carefully conceived with three decks, you know, and uh, separate rooms. And there was also a storage room enough, you know, uh, to store food for the animals and the human beings for more than a year, or if, if not, you know, uh, 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 a year or so. Now, all these were laid, you know, uh, in an orderly manner. And so the size of the ship probably was, you know, that of a football field. You can imagine if you know how big a football field is. Reasonably sized ship by any standards, by even by today's modern uh, 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 shipbuilding uh, uh, industry standards, adequately built for the job. And two particular in, uh, observations, uh, 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 further scientific observations that I might want to make here is the fact that you all might know that Noah's Ark actually floated simply because of what is called the Archimedes Principles. You heard about that, right? You know, in, your, in, in, your, in those uh, days when you study uh, uh, Form 4 or Form 5 about the uh, Archimedes Principle, the law of buoyancy, the law of flotation, all right? Uh, and this was discovered actually only um, uh, about more than 2,000 years later and after Noah built the Ark. And also, if you notice, uh, just now we talk about 450 uh, feet long and, and, uh, and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Immediately, some of you, you know, you've been mathematical mind, you know that this is the ratio of uh, 30 is to 5 is to 3, right? And this is apparently a perfect ratio, you know, for building you know, a, a worthy uh, uh, a ship, uh, uh, what do you call that, the seagoing vessel that is, uh, all right? And so therefore, uh, this, this particular uh, ratio of 30 is to 5 and 3 still holds to today, uh, even by today's modern uh, ship engi uh, shipbuilding, uh, engineering, and technology. Uh. And so, therefore, what I'm just trying to say here is that this is an instance you know, where technology of the time was utilized for God's glory and purposes to save lives of human, you know, of animals and birds and creeping, you know, creeping creatures and so on, all right, and of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this great time of punishment of the flood. Uh. And let me, let, let me show you another instance, all right, of God's use of technology, and that is in the construction you know, of Solomon's temple. Right, uh. You know, church, there is, uh, in the construction of Solomon's temple, uh, one circumstance that is so remarkable and amazing that I must point this out to you. All right, uh, if you were, if you care to read uh, uh, one Kings chapter six and verse seven, shall we read all this together? It says this. Uh, all right, it's a very interesting one. It says, "In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built." The wood and the stones and uh, uh, the shaping of the parts were all done or prepared you know, at the distance you know, from the temple site. All right? It was at the quarry, that is. Now, these were then brought to the site of the temple, 
perfectly fitted together for the, you know, for, for the situation from which each of these parts would, would stand. And these were all framed and matched you know, with such unerring skill, uh, church, you know, you probably will have noticed and you read just now that during the whole construction proper, uh, process, there was no occasion on which an axe or a hammer, you know, is being used. That the whole structure was completed without the smallest noise. Amazing, isn't it? And you could say that here was an impressive example, an early example of prefabricated construction technology. You who are in the construction technology, you will know that. The glory of Solomon's temple, you know, was something of a world wonder. So he has another instance, you know, that God blessed this use of technology, you know, for his own glory and purpose. Now let me turn your attention to a different area of science that God taught the Hebrew people. And it is in the whole area of uh, public health science, actually. Now, let, 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 let us read uh, a, 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 a portion of a, a scripture here, all right, in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Okay? Uh, it says, When you are encamped against your enemies, keep away from everything impure. If one of your men is unclean because of nocturnal emission, he is to go outside the camp and, and stay there. But as evening approaches, he is to wash himself, and at sunset he may return to the camp. And destiny a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. And as part of your equipment, have something to dig with, and when you relieve yourself, Dig a hole and cover up your excrement. And for the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver you know, uh, uh, your enemies uh, uh, to you and to deliver your enemies to you. And your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. Church, isn't that amazing? How down to earth the word of God you know, can be to us all. That it deals with life at its most basic the gods had brought a great deliverance, we all know, for more than two and a half million Israelites. And they have experienced the miracle of the parting of the, of the Red Sea. And, and they have uh, been eating mir uh, a miracle manna dropped from heaven and quails and so on, on a daily basis. But they still, church, have to relieve themselves. They still have to ease themselves. And what do you think God is teaching here, church? But what they will say is basic hygiene and sanitation. What God is teaching here is basically community health and prevention, church. And then, uh, as you turn the pages of the book of Moses, all right, you will come across what we often refer to as uh, unclean scriptures. I want to read some of these to you, all right? Uh, uh, and it goes something like this. Patching... Uh, uh, you, uh, these are the things that will make you unclean. Like, wait, what uh, would make a person unclean? It says, touching anything taken as spoils of war, touching human bone or grave, touching or being in the presence of a dead body, touching the discharge of a woman's period, touching the discharge of a man's semen, touching a man with a bodily discharge or his spit, touching even the bed or the saddle touched by a man with a bodily discharge, touching the nocturnal emission of a man, and touching human uncleanness, meaning the urine and feces. Church, do you know that God actually told the people, you know, people of Israel, that if you obey, you know, my laws, you will have none of the diseases of the nation that surrounds you. And when God said, or gave all these decrees, uh, he is not giving some kind of a formula for spiritual magic, you know, or, 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 or something to the tune of that, you know. He is basically uh, teaching the prevention of transmittable diseases. God was already teaching this nearly 3,800 years before man will even discover germs. And it was not until 
the late 17th century that we will learn that you know there are you know what is called the invisible microbes and viruses that can be transmitted from one thing to another that cause and cause diseases. And furthermore, it was not even until as late as the 1990s uh, that we come to understand that the most viral transmitters you know, of these invisible enemies are the bodily fluids. And it takes the AIDS epidemic to reveal you know, to us the extent of God's advanced understanding of transmittable diseases that is. Church, jumping many centuries you know, from the Old Testament times in, into world history, we come to this present age of the modern science and technology, you know, where the Pastor Dan has mentioned a little bit of that, you know, where men have done such amazing things. For example, we all know for a fact that there were 24 men, you know, who have been to the moon and back, and 12 of whom have walked on the surface of the moon. You know, you and I probably, you know, will think that you know it's you know, something in out of our comprehension and that things like this can be done but of course it happened and we all believed it but my point here is this church that 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 this modern science and technology that enable all these things to happen actually it is a quite a recent development all right in history and it is interesting to uh, to uh, to see where the roots of science and technology uh, lies all right uh, that this science and applied technology and where does it come from actually that that seems to be good evidence that it actually comes and it lies you know uh, with the reformation and uh, in the protestant protestant reformation that we have the roots of modern science and technology church and it is true that many of the pioneers uh, of uh, modern science and technology uh, are men and women of great or deep Christian convictions who saw what they were doing you know, as something, you know, or as an opportunity to glorify God. And I've got some pictures of some of these people, and uh, that's my hero uh, as, uh, as a chemist, you know, Robert Boy, you know, or the Boy's Law, all right, the father of modern chemistry, you know, Antonio Van uh, Leeuwenhoek, discoverer of bacteria. John Dalton, again, a uh, uh, chemist, uh, you know, uh, uh, father of modern atomic theory. John Ambrose Fleming, the founder of modern electronics, inventor of the diode. James Joel, you know, Joel's law, uh, discoverer of the first law of thermodynamics. William uh, Thomas Kelvin, you know, Kelvin, all right, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the first, you know, to uh, clearly state the second law of thermodynamics. Johann Kepler, Kepler, discovery of the laws of planetary motion. Maxwell, uh, father of uh, modern physics. Of course, many of us know Gregor Mendel, father of genetics. Isaac Newton, of course, uh, discovery of the universal law of uh, gravitation. Brian Pascal, you know, some of the mathematician physicists may know that uh, he's a mathematical uh, prodigy and, and a universal uh, uh, genius. Louis Pasteur, formulator, uh, formulator of the germ theory. Now, these are church, uh, because you know what, well, we can go on and on, all right? Uh, now, these are just some of the famous scientists uh, who are committed Christians and many more. And all these works grew out of their belief, of the conviction that it is God who so ordered you know, the universe or the world, you know, well, as its creator. And so that this world can therefore, you know, be discovered, can be known, you know, through observation or rational observation or experimentation and, uh, and uh, analysis and so on. And so therefore, my point here is this, that church, be unafraid, you know, of science and technology. Be unafraid to be involved in this particular domain. And secondly, church, when we, when we speak about science and technology, we want to speak about the benefits, the tremendous benefits that it brings to humankind and society. And so that at the end of the day, you know, we may be encouraged, may be excited, may be impassioned you know, by these things. Sir. First, to our lives, the benefits that the S&T brings to our lives. You know, today, modern science you know, has shaped and improved our lives dramatically. Medicine, you know, medical devices you know, have come a long way in, in not only saving, you know, but also in prolonging lives. You know. 
And just a week ago, and I was reading, you know, that uh, uh, there's more than a hundred institutes uh, from this, uh, uh, the researchers from more than hundred institutes when they came together, and they reported that new that new genetic works, you know, should in the future help doctors to calculate an individual's uh, cancer risk way before, all right, uh, any symptoms were to emerge. How do you like that? And today, of course, we know for a fact that we can travel rapidly, you know, in jets, you know, in uh, automobiles, trains, you know, over great distances. And all right, that you may know here, of course, you may be here today, tomorrow you may be in London, you know, Los Angeles, and you know, Melbourne, or Sydney, or you may be back in, uh, you know, or KK or you know, Kuching and so on. But church, I also want to say this to you, uh, that, okay, there, there's so much more, all right, uh, that we can today, for example, harness, you know, the power of the rivers, you know, and make them into dam, you know, generate electricity and so on, and, and predict storms and weather, you know, uh, used to joke about, you know, uh, you know, it's no more the case, you know, because... Some of my friends who are scientists in meteorological services, you know, these are people who are amazing people and, good, and able to do amazing things, you know, and the use of uh, um, the power of atom and so on. So we can see, you know, anywhere on the planet via television and even gaze, you know, to the Hubble telescope, you know, to the outermost, you know, of the universe and so on, and upon the, you know, surfaces of sea and uh, of the moon and Mars and Venus and, and, and so on. And... What, what, of course, you know, what Pastor Daniel said uh, earlier, we can text, we can call, we can voicemail, we can send images, video calls, access social network uh, sites, you know, through our mobile phones. And so, therefore, we are closely connected, you know, uh, uh, in, in a society, you know, to one another and so on. And the, the internet and, uh, and uh, digital technologies have changed, you know, the whole, world, you know, the whole way of doing business and, and, and conduct meetings and, and even changed the whole new way of doing church you know, as uh, you know, we heard just now that even right now while I'm speaking, you know, uh, there are so many out there. You know, uh, uh, my, my, my son uh, last night was telling me, you know, that, Pa, uh, uh, you are preaching to me, you know, uh, um, he, he, you know he, he's in Melbourne, you know, in my living room, you know. I mean, this is, you know, what you get, all right. Uh, um, and so uh, th- people are listening in, you know, through you know, our live internet uh, streaming and so on. And people are also, I think, you know, even at the Right now, when we, we are here, the people are assessing or uh, uh, coming to our website, and many of those people who have come uh, are anonymous seekers, all right, who may not want to come to church, uh, but they you know, are able to find out all the information, about, not just about us, but about faith in Jesus Christ. And many, you know, in the process, you know, be led to know Christ in that sense. Besides the benefits that science has brought you know, to our lives, uh, modern science and technology has also contributed tremendously you know, to nation building. You know, that. And it's become the primary engine of economic growth for our own country all right, and brought about enormous wealth. One of the best examples that I think of you know, is the whole you know, area of the palm tree value chain you know, uh, in Malaysia that, is, uh, you know, that our country first imported uh, a palm seedling from uh, Nigeria. Some of you, if you may not know, it's only as uh, uh, early, or, you know, in the, in 19, the early uh, 1960s days. And so, through well planned R and D and and technology applications, and thank God for you know such body as MPOB, you know, Malaysian Palm Oil, you know, board and so on. You know, our country has developed commercial value for the entire you know palm uh, tree that is from cooking oil, you know, to food production to consumer product, you know, like vitamin E supplements, as I said, you know, and the, and uh, uh, and uh, right through to cosmetics, you know, uh, to biodiesel and fertilizer and animal feed you know, uh, production and so on. So many more, so much more in the sense. And it has become today the fourth uh, largest contributor to our national economy and currently accounts for more than 50 billion all right, uh, ringgit uh, uh, in our gross national income, that is. Besides the, 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 uh, the uh, palm oil industry, Biotechnology, whether it is in the area of agrobiotech or, or health biotech you know, or industrial biotechnology, it is fast becoming you know, a new engine of growth you know, for our nation. Right, and it is estimated that you know, it will probably contribute up to 5% you know, of the, our country's gross national product you know, by 2020. 
And of course, we also know, you know, about huge amount of technology applications, you know, that have been used you know, to, uh, to this whole area of oil, gas, and energy sectors, you know, which is the largest contributor, you know, of our national economy, that is. Other emerging technologies, you know, of, um, that is vital, you know, to our nation's development, includes all fields of engineering, you know, advanced materials, telecommunications, semiconductor technology, nanotechnology, or microelectronics and digital technology and computer systems and software and, and manufacturing system and, and all these that many of you are well versed with. Now, the reason I want to say, I, I say all these things is so that church, that we will begin to understand or to get a picture you know, of the tremendous opportunities that S&T and science and technology has to offer to us. That our country today not only needs scientists, and more scientists, but more Christian scientists. Because I believe it is a great mission field, a great domain for Christian influence. And so therefore, my third and final theme you know, on this whole area of our role in science and technology is uh, how then can we get involved? How, can, how then can you and I get involved you know, in this domain? Now, there are uh, basically three key sectors of influence in which you know, we, even Christians, can be involved in. And first of which, first of which, of course, is in the industry. You know, and here, you know, uh, you know, scientists, you know, uh, uh, technology people out there will probably find higher salaries and the satisfaction of seeing practical results and, and products that come for it, you know, and so on. And, and sometimes, I say sometimes, better research uh, facilities, but not necessarily so. You know, in education, in a field of education, of course, you know, the scientist finds, you know, perhaps maybe uh, uh, salaries a little bit lower, but usually enjoy greater independence. You know, he has uh, uh, more contact with people and, uh, you know, having often the chance to contribute, you know, or combine teaching and research and so on. And, and there is, of course, you know, if you are a scientist, you know, in the institutions, you know, and uh, there is this whole area of prestige and recognition and the respect of our, our fellow scientists and so on. In the government, for, in, in particular, of course, uh, you know, people like me, uh, you know, uh, salary, <laughs> no doubt, is low. But there are, um, and, uh, but I want to tell you that there are ample opportunities uh, for research in all areas, all right, and the chance to influence, you know, policies and the drafting of laws and regulations, which I can actually, uh, you know, attest to that. But whatever it is, uh, church, whichever sector that we may, you know, go into, you know, or call, you know, into. Here is a challenge. Or here is a challenge. I want to I want to pluck this off, you know, from London Cope's, uh, you know, of our, our, our working mission statement you know, that he challenges, you know, the science professional. And and this perhaps, you know, can be, you know, for many of us, you know, out in the industry, in the S and T industry, you know, that can be, you know, our working uh, our mission statement. That is, and it goes like this: it says, uh, the challenge is to discover and use God's laws for the blessing of all people. Pursuing a higher standard of living, better health, and better stewardship of all God's natural resources. All right. Now, what comes next is this, church, that the advancement uh, and the use of uh, science and technology also come with it uh, a whole set of ethical issues. Never before has you know, our society you know, been able you know, or, or to, to, to work so many technological miracles and yet uh, so unsure of our moral moorings and direction. For example, you know, in the whole area of, of life science, uh, 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 research in life sciences, for example, you know, the implications here are huge, church. The production of genetically modified foods, you know, which my department was able to take me, you know, when, when you put these things on and to, to be able to test. Uh, and so that when you go out into the market, you know, today, when and housewives, uh, you know, we go, you know, uh, you can see all these products and they are warning you, you know, not just warning you, uh, just giving you a choice, you know, that these are GMFs, all right, if you, you know, if you look carefully some of these, all right. Uh, and it, it can have the potential, for example, to resolve the problem of world hunger, 
And then you have this whole area of human genome uh, project, you know, with the aim of mapping and sequencing for you know, the whole of uh, human DNA, and many teams, you know, are into it and so on. You know, the cloning, you know, and the human uh, uh, and human stem cell research, you know, uh, that we all read about, you know, with the promises of uh, possible cures for many of the genetic diseases and so on. Church, we need Christians. Christians, you know, in many of these fields, and in particular, you know, in the life sciences, you know, uh, that will en enter these uh, fields as uh, uh, their, their mission field, you know, to be a voice of calm and conscience, all right, uh, uh, in these places. Now, next, next up is this whole area where today science and technology professionals uh, are, may I say, increasingly in demand in the mission field. Traditionally, uh, physicians, dentists, uh, and nurses, and these are the people who have served in many capacities, both you know, in uh, 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 possibly you know, uh, short-term or career uh, basis in the mission field. But today, let me say that you know, uh, uh, there are what we call the ten makers all right? And these include you know, the science professionals you know, who are using their skills to enter areas where traditional uh, missions are forbidden. Many, you know, of course, you, know, you can be you know, by university professors you know, in many of these areas you know, who are good in uh, uh, some of your fields. And therefore, what I'm saying is, can we not, uh, as a church, you know, as a people of God, you know, here even in UMC, you know, but to apply our scientific minds in a mission field, whether locally and you know, among the Orang Asals and Orang Asli's, and, you know, uh, or the poorer countries where we have you know, vested interest in our missions, like you know, in Cambodia and uh, Myanmar and Nepal and so on. To deal with issues almost relating to public health, uh, to sanitation, to diseases, you know, to uh, the elevation of uh, poverty. When I speak about the elevation of poverty, it's basically because you know, I want to give you an outstanding example of how technology and innovation have helped you know, uh, to both lift you know, poor people out of uh, poverty and directly save lives. And these are, uh, 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 these are many initiatives taken by what is undertaken by what is called the transformation, uh, Transformational Business Network, in short, as the T TBN. All right, now. now, incidentally, uh, this particular uh, 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 network you know, is set up or co-founded by Dr. Dr. Kim Tan. You know, uh, he's no stranger to us, you know, has been with us and preaching from this pulpit on you know, a number of uh, uh, occasions. Uh, uh, Kim, Kim holds a uh, PhD in biochemistry and an influential uh, leader in the life science sectors and a biotech uh, entrepreneur. And I always remember, you know, when I was in the science uh, you know, uh, ministry, um, my former minister will always be so proud of this man and, and he used to show off, you know, to... Okay, I, I don't know, I'm recorded. You know, to, to people, you know, that, you know, that he could just pick up the phone and call Dr. Kim Tan, you know, that he is associated with him and know that you know, this is you know, a, a, a great man in this whole area, you know, in biotechnology. You know. Having founded, you know, uh, uh, many companies and sits on all kinds of uh, boards and companies as advisors and directors, this man, you know, a godly man, you know, in Dr. Uh, uh, Kim Tan. Um, so over a meal uh, sometime last year, uh, uh, after he spoke, uh, he spoke to me, uh, he, he, he mentioned to me about, you know, uh, uh, an example of cooking in, uh, in Africa. That most Africans, uh, they cook meals using what Kim calls a three-stone technology. Have you heard of three-stone technology? And basically, essentially, three stones uh, on which the cooking pot sits, uh, all right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, it is heated by charcoal and, uh, and, and wood. Such a method uh, is actually not only a, uh, only posing health risk, you know, uh, that every time you cook, you know, it is for them, uh, you know, it's equivalent to smoking something like, something like 40, 40 cigarettes you know, a day. And not only that, it is a fire hazard, and it also causes deforestation, we know, you know, which means that women, therefore, and girls will have to walk further and further away you know, uh, uh, to find firewood and put in them at great risk of being raped and so on. And so therefore, you know, Kim and, and his team in the TBN, you know, they found an innovator from Stanford University 
who has devised a solar uh, cooking stove that saves up to 50% in fuel. And, and so far, more than, apparently, more than 50,000 you know, have been sold in, in Kenya alone. Entrepreneurs also uh, um, uh, have put you know, the solar uh, technology to other good uses in Kenya, in Tanzania, and Uganda, and so on. Um, and, uh, and one of the remarkable things that Kim said is that uh, you know, in these places, uh, almost everyone you know, owns a mobile phone. Wow. You know? And he said that it is one of the great, great gifts uh, for the poor. But one problem, unfortunately, what happened is you know, they have nowhere to charge them. And so many are switched off, you know, are not switched on, you know, and they have, you know, for some, they have to walk long distances and pay, you know, a huge amount of money just to get them you know, to be charged and so on. And so a solar panel, uh, you know, made in the United Kingdom and manufactured in China, you know, was the solution, you know, uh, uh, however, uh, that, that offers, you know, mobile phone users the opportunity not only to charge them, but to be able to use even this panel uh, to power a lamp so that they all can read, you know, and uh, also to listen to the radio, you know, and of course, you know, the opportunity, you know, uh, 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 to uh, send uh, Christian messages, you know, uh, in a way. And they cost only $30, you know, and because of carbon credits, you know, that they receive and so on, they can be subsidized. You know. It's amazing things, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, S&T, you know, uh, can do and, you know, with people like us, you know, uh, if we can put our scientific minds together, you know, uh, for the elevation of our poverty days. And here, in uh, uh, Conclusion, I would also like to uh, share my own input, and this is into the, you know, into the, the government sector. I was a government chemist, you know, and to be more exact, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, one who specializes in forensic science. Uh, and just to tell you how interesting, and uh, for some people who might think of uh, going into the field of chemistry, you know, uh, how interesting the job of uh, the chemist is, you know, uh, uh, and incidentally, another of our pastors, you know, uh, uh, is also a chemist, you know, uh, for more than 20 years. You know, wow, you know, at least uh, right now. Uh, so by way of telling this story, uh, you will see how interesting uh, uh, a chemist's job is. You know, one day, a physicist, you know, a biologist and a chemist, they were going out to the ocean for the first time. Right? For the first time in their life, they were going out to the ocean. So the physicist, uh, he was so thrilled and so excited when he saw the ocean, you know, and was fascinated by the waves. And so what he wanted to do, he says, oh, I want to uh, do some research, you know, on the fluid dynamic, you know, of the waves. And so he walked into the ocean, never to return. Then the biologist said that when he saw the ocean, you know, water was, you know, not polluted like, at the time. It was so very clean and he could see, you know, the underwater, the flora and the fauna and so on. He says, I want to do research on that. And so therefore he walked into the ocean. And he also never returned. Then the chemist, what happened was, he waited for a long time, you know, showing what was happening. And afterwards, he took out, you know, a writing pad and he made this observation. He said, the physicist and the biologist are soluble in ocean water. <laughs> That's how interesting <laughs> the job of the chemist is, you know. Chemists, you know, we always say, chemists, have solutions all right, for anything. <laughs> Just as I, you know, as a government chemist, you know, my job, you know, was, uh, you know, were to provide scientific uh, services to uh, government agencies relating to uh, public health in the areas of food and water safety. For example, you know, uh, for more than 30 years, and today you have to thank me for that, you know, for 30 years, for more than 30 years, I am looking after, I have been looking after your water quality. All right, the water that you've been drinking, you know, all the foods that you eat, you know, um, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, you know uh, there are no pesticides and uh, you know, uh, and they all comply with the ingredients as stated and so on, uh, and all those all those are done, you know, in my department and you know, uh, providing data, you know, to ensure environmental quality, whether it's the river pollution, air pollution, and uh, you know, uh, uh, some of you who may have. Uh, what you call it, uh, factories, and if you were to, uh, you know, dump all the influence there, you know, and be sure that I know what you are doing, okay? Public sector, 
you know, uh, 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 public uh, order and security, you know, in the, uh, the community justice system, you know, about consumer protection, occupational safety and health. And these are some of the things, the, the, the scientific support services that we provide rather for. And I also, of course, you know, as Pastor Daniel said, uh, you know, uh, testified as a scientific expert in the course of laws. And, and actually, last night I went back and I calculated again. I think I probably in the high courts alone, you know, I could have in my career, you know, appeared before the high courts as an as a, as a expert witness, something like three to four hundred occasions at least. And subsequently, of course, you know, I also received special training at the crime laboratory of the Los Angeles Police Department and you know, in the whole area of forensic science. And that's where, you know, all this CSI stuff, you know, comes into play. And, and I'm pity many of you, you know, who have been uh, kind of conned into, you know, those kind of shows in the CSI, you know. Uh, without realizing that actually, you know, when I was in LAPD, you know, well, the, many of these people who come from Hollywood, you know, and start shooting, you know, what are some of the things that we were doing? Right? It's a lot of over dramatization, you know, of this whole process. All right? <laughs> Talk to me about some of these things, okay, <laughs> uh, later on. No? And so, you may ask, how do I connect what I do as a scientist uh, in the government, you know, with my Christian calling? Now, what I do as a scientist you know, with the government, I want to say this, all right, it's also important. Like what many of you are doing, are contributing into the s and industry, for example. And it is not, as some may feel, uh, an unspiritual profession. No calling in God's kingdom is second rate, I mean. The pastor and the, uh, and, and the I won't say the elders, the pastors and, and others, you know, so-called full-time you know, workers in the church, they have one job to do, but you and I, we have ours, and we have another. And so therefore, as a Christian scientist, what I do is I take my job seriously and do it heartily and for the Lord, as we have read you know, earlier on you know, in the scripture, in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 20 to 24. Can we read that again? It, because it applies for all of us across the board. All right? It says, whatever, let's read together, 1, 2, and 3. Whatever you do, work it, at it in all your heart and reverence for the Lord, not for men since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord you know, as a reward. So as I said, I work as hard and as smart as I can, you know, even in the uh, civil service context, and I picked up and as much knowledge and skill as possible and uh, to continuous le uh, uh, learning and, and, uh, from, from my uh, 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 colleagues who are good in their fields, and you know, I, I try to improve myself and aim to excel you know, in what I'm doing. I, uh, so I actually became, in, in the end, you know, uh, quite an authority in, in several fields of the forensic science and in, in the quality systems and so on. But more importantly, and let me say this to you, church, uh, that I believe that more than just being the best uh, to excel you know, in my work, you know, uh, uh, in what I do, my calling you know, is really more than that. My calling is basically to be an influencer, to be the change agent uh, by virtue of my being the salt and light, you know, as Jesus tells me to. And so I thank God that in more than 33 years of my loyal service, I say loyal service to my organizations because every now and then, you know, young people, they can't stay for more than a year, two years uh, in their organizations. I was able to bring about some significant, you know, changes and transformation that includes providing transformation leadership. You know, in my last few years, you know, as Pastor Nate has mentioned, that I was the Director General of the Department of Chemistry. And, and the Lord has enabled me you know, to provide transformation leadership to the department. And this was in order that you know, my organization was able to, uh, to, to function and to play a frontline and responsive you know, role in fulfilling the mandate that the nation has given to us and, and people like you have given to us, uh, which is to provide a full range of, of excellent scientific services to safeguard the nation's wealth and health and environment and the criminal justice system. And I could say that when I walked off from the department, when I retired, you know, uh, that you know, we probably have one of the best you know, uh, uh, scientific equipment in the country and, and uh, my, my staff have been so well trained in so many areas that what the world can do, we can do. And so the other thing is you know, uh, that I left behind you know, a culture of excellence and quality. Quality issues are critical to us. You know, uh, not only that you know, we need to meet the most stringent uh, international standards, uh, 
Yeah, because many of our goods and you know, a lot of our products, you know, will go overseas, right? You know, so on the other end, if they were to uh, receive these goods, uh, they must ensure that you know what they have, you know, the certificate of analysis and you know what and approval that comes from a recognized, you know, and, 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 and a competent, you know, a laboratory that is, uh, you know, to be able to do that. And so that is where we come in. Okay. Um, and so, um, and not only that, of course, you know, uh, uh, we have to be really good, you know, in our in our quality system because you know, uh, you know all our reports goes to the courts, and you know, to be able to withstand, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of scrutiny, you know, in the course of law, you know, we have to be really good in that sense. And so, uh, church, I just want to say this that you know, uh, the transformation process that I and something like three to four hundred of my scientists uh, that works with me, you know, we were eventually and uh, actually able to be uh, accredited to many of the international standards, you know, in all fields of our scientific services and including our forensic science, you know, with the FBI and so on. And, and so we were also at the end of the day, you know, we were the recipients of uh, uh, the coveted Prime Minister's Quality Award. And so what I did was uh, we began you know, to share our transformation journey, you know, with other government agencies and ministries and private sector organizations. And for many years without fail, uh, even the National uh, Institute of Public Administration, at every opportunity they will send participants, you know, uh, uh, in their courses to view firsthand you know, the practice of uh, quality and excellence in my department. And time again, I just want to say, you know, that the Lord has blessed me and I gave him, you know, as I gave him my best. And little also did I realize that, you know, uh, because, you know, I'm in the civil service, you know, and, uh, and usually, you know, I finish at, you know, in the early days at 4 and then 4.30 and 5, you know, that after that, I have got another eight more hours, you know, where can I can moonlight in the church. <laughs> Meaning to say that, you know, uh, you know, later I realized that there is such a thing as bi-vocational, you know, thing, you know, uh, and that's that, that the rewards, you know, the rewards, uh, you know, are huge, you know, you know, simply because, you know, I... Uh, Continued, you know, to be loyal, you know, to the civil service. Anyway, uh, I want to end now, you know, uh, uh, with a challenge, you know, for the science and technology professionals and to the next generations of scientists and, and, and science professionals. And this is this church that, as a professional in the science domain, I want to say that you have a high calling, right? Um, and Ask yourself, challenge yourself, all right? Am I one of God's George Washington covers? Am I called to hold in my hand something that, you know, of, of God's creation and that I can tell, you know, uh, and say to God, God, you made this and you said that it was good. And why did you make this? I don't know. You may have in your hands, you know, uh, uh, peanuts, plants, you know, chips, transistor, chemical, metals, atom, DNA cell, planet, bark, software, whatever. You know best what it is. Lift up your hands and tell God, God, you made this and you said that it was good. Why did you make this? The sky is not the limit, church. God's revelation of himself stretches to the outermost, the further reaches of the cosmos. Perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, church, God may use you to reveal to us and to strike us, you know, with awe again with what he's going to do with the things that he has put in your hands. God, I want to say that you a part of God's strategy, you science professionals for discipling all nations.